add one other thing? Sorry. I, 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 mean, I think you're, you're right about this. The only thing I would add is that there's another side to, um, there's two things. One, the way Sharia law circulates in a popular American discourse, people don't have a clue. All it, it's, 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 in other words, it's a sort of, it's part of the racialized representation of, of sort of Muslims as a physical embodiment of terrorism, right? And so it's obscurity works. On the other hand, the Gulf states, as you know better than anybody, um, are places that actually do show signs of a kind of neoliberal order. Um, the use of low-wage imported labor, for example. Um, and the, so there are those who sort of defend the Gulf states, like Bahrain, as places where, okay, well, this is the future of capital, you know, without any reference at all. So I think that all these things are operating simultaneously, which, which really deserves an investigation in terms of even internally the politics of, you know, the meanings of property in relationship to Islamic law. Uh, in relationship to, again, U.S. and other multinational investments in these companies. In these so we'll companies. take a few more questions from the floor, and then we must stop. Mm -hmm. So we'll take uh, one, two, three, and four. Carry on. Then we'll stop. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, yeah, my question is, uh, I'm, an, I'm an organizer, and a prominent organizer here in Los Angeles. been for about almost 20, 25 years. And uh, one of the concepts is this concept of neutrality and dispelling it, because either for the most part, neutrality is acquiescence is dominant narrative. And in the legal realm as well as in the community, how do we get how do we get that from being a default in the work that we do or the research we do and the work that we do? How do we get the community to understand that neutrality is just an acquiescence is dominant narrative and it needs to be shifted or just totally dispelled? Great. Hold that, that question. question. Next, Next one. one. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Um, so I had a question um, based on something that Marvin J. Pradden just said about how some segments of the white female students might not think of getting a job as a problem. And that also combined in my mind with what Kimberly Crenshaw had said about this sort of neoliberal bootstrap way of getting one's way to success. So do you think that your students in the classroom now, and it has a change over time, see themselves in this post-racial way? and then? Do your colleagues reinforce that, or do they problematize that? And has that changed? Because maybe it's the well-meaning ones who would have problematized it before, but now in some way end up reinforcing it. OK, I think we're getting really warmed up. Uh, <laughs> question? Yes, uh, this question is for Angela Riley. Uh, Kimberly Crenshaw, in her remarks, referenced the half the goings on in 1993, just a year before whiteness is property. And interestingly, one of the goings on was Congress's enactment of the Religious Freedom Restoration Act in large measure in response to the Oregon versus Smith decision, which involved, of course, Native American who wanted to smoke peyote as part of his religious worship. And I was just curious to get your thoughts on the Burwell versus Hobby Lobby case and the Tyler Stoke of Woods cases in which now that same act that was arguably enacted to benefit members of religious minorities ends up sort of giving whiteness this more explicit Christian dimension because you have white shareholders of closely held corporations that are now claiming individual religious liberty rights. And so I was curious to get your thoughts on the way that the court has now sort of turn the Religious Freedom Restoration Act on its head. The final, th thank you very much. And the final question. So this question is directed at Professor Justice Riley, so obviously with the brains and pores. Um, in your very moving talk, you discussed uh, the Native American analogs to Dred Scott and Ferguson. And also, I know your talk was a bit rushed, but you also then discussed the racist depictions of Native Americans, who has the sports mascots. Um, and also, I, mean, I was in Georgia at the time, but I was also wondering if you could say something, something similar on with respect to the Confederate flag, discussion of the Confederate flag, what we have now, discussing it in the U.S. Southern uh, states about uh, continuing to keep that flag, as well as its depiction on license plates and so forth. So again, that's kind of another analog I reached to hear your thoughts about. All right, so we have a couple of questions on the floor. So one is about neutrality, whether it acquiesces in the dominant baseline and how we might contest it. Another about post-racialing 
post-racial imaginings, particularly on the part of our students and whether our colleagues uh, actually contest that or not. A specific question to Angela about the um, freedom Religious Freedom Act and whether the most recent Supreme Court opinion actually uh, establishes a privilege around whiteness and a religious freedom. And finally, a question to Angela again about whether or not there are ways to build out the analogy you were drawing between um, cases involving Native Americans and those involving uh, African Americans, specifically issue around the Confederate flag. So uh, any takers on the neutrality point? Kim. Oh. <laughs> See, I, I was doing that classroom thing that you guys do. It's like, if you don't meet their eyes, they won't follow. It wasn't working, obviously. And, and you see it, it doesn't work. Well, <laughs> can, can I start with the post-racial and, and see if I wind up sure. there? Um, so, um, I... I think gener generationally, there is indeed a huge difference between um, the starting positions of, of students um, in this generation and, and that which prevailed when I started in, in 86. Um, that's not surprising, of course, because no one was talking post-racial talk um, in 86. They were talking colorblind talk. Um, and I think students came into the classroom with a greater capacity to contest colorblindness, partly because um, it was the calling card of the conservative anti-affirmative action um, uh, juggernaut in American society. Post-racial comes um, with Obama, and it comes with um, uh, you know, more of, more of a, um, I guess, liberal profile to it, and people, it takes people a while to figure out um, what its connections are to actual policy, how it gets deployed, um, what post-racial is actually doing. Um, specifically, I think one of the things that I've seen happen with students is a sense that, you know, to be the person who, who names race is to be the person who has a racial problem. Even when people are trying to talk about racial problems, they try to use non-racial talk to talk about racial problems <laughs> because that that sanction is, is so severe. Right. Um, so recently I was at a school brought in because there were racial problems and asked to talk to some of the student leaders of color and it was hard to get the conversation going I knew that there had been like four incidents on campus that were deeply racialized incidents and when I asked the students to tell me what's happening what's going on there they talk about everything else except the racial problem and then when we get to the racial problem they say well I don't think they meant it or I'm not saying they're racist but everything starts with a, I'm not calling you it us the society racist but so so there 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 is really you know I think a um, a moment that that we're into but now what my claim has been is that the post-racial moment is officially over after Ferguson I think once um, you have the New York Times, the New York Times basically saying that Ferguson is a product of historical and institutionalized forms of racism. This is the New York Times saying in an op-ed, you know, we've seen the little man behind the curtain. I don't think we can go back um, at this point. And the real question, I think, is whether we are able to consistently build on this consciousness uh, breaking, you know, sort of moment mm -hmm. and stop performing. Some part of it turns on how much the president is actually being pushed to step into this space in ways that are far more robust than what we've seen so far. Another part of it is this battle that we're going to have over um, Holder's replacement. That is an opportunity, mm -hmm. I think, for anti-racist forces to not concede to it's not possible and actually make some muscle, show, uh, show some muscle in this moment. So, yeah, now, neutrality, you take it. Oh, no, no, I hear it. <laughs> Neil. Um, I, I had a thought. Yeah, um, yeah. Which is that um, one, of the, one of the ways to, and it comes from zero practical experience, this is all that <laughs> professor stuff, um, but, but it is, it's the idea of revalorizing identity. That, that, that identity, it's, and this is just an intuition, I've never been able to, I, I've gotten as far as a, a, a talk and as some slides, but um, there's a taxonomy of identity uh, in equal protection and constitutional law. Um, and most of it is, most time is spent ignoring it. That is to say, it doesn't really exist, which again seems a little problematic. But the idea is that if you valorize identity, you can reaffirm blackness. 
lot being Mexican, being Asian American, um, there is a price and a cost, and it has to be done very carefully. But anecdotally, um, it is Japanese Americans who responded to post 9-11, to what happened to Arabs and Muslims, because it is, it is seared into our personal racial memory, what happened. And so, mm. so, so it, no one, you know, all that other stuff, right? And it's about religion. Right? Japanese Americans are majority Buddhists, or at least they were. Um, and so, um, you know, all this stuff about religion, and, and again, in the historical memory, it was the rounding up, the rounding up of the priests, and the, and, and the, the focus upon Buddhists and, and social activities associated with the Buddhist temples. That was one of the targets in World War II. So those recollections mean that trying to be neutral or use other means to explain why it was okay uh, to talk about, uh, you know, rounding up and putting Muslims uh, uh, into camps w was sort of just had this deep resonance. The, the, the other, the, the, another example is sort of like um, where it hasn't taken place is sort of the Chinese petitioners in San Francisco who were suing to uh, break up the affirmative action programs for Lowell High, I mean for the elite high, not Lowell, for, for um, the elite high schools, uh, because their kids, their, their kids were not being able to get in, getting into uh, the elite school uh, because there was an affirmative action that put lower qualified students in there. Um, and, and I think it has something to do uh, with the fact that, that, you know, that remember that Plymouth Rock, Malcolm X and Plymouth Rock, Plymouth <laughs> Rock landed on us. Right. Uh, it hasn't happened in recent memory to Chinese Americans. Uh, they're, they're product of post-65 immigration. Now, for Korean Americans, there was a, there's a, at least a partial moment that took place in the Los Angeles uprisings, um, you know, when, when the, the riots kept, when the, the Violence kept closer, crept closer. Uh, they turned to the police and said, we want you to protect us. And curiously enough, the line was drawn on the other side of Koreatown, and Koreatown burned down. And, and this is, this was a clear racial, this occupies a place in people's political discourse and discussion. So, so, so it's a complex thing to be able to figure out how to valorize identity around culture, around history in positive ways, and, and that, because identity is so deeply racial, takes racial forms um, in this complex way in our society, that, that somehow that can be, if that can be leveraged into a means of saying that neutrality stuff, you, trust me, you know, when it comes time, when, when the crunch really comes about being neutral, uh, there's no such thing. Uh, it ain't gonna happen. Uh, and so that, that's just, it, it's not a, I don't think concrete, because I don't have any concrete experiences, uh, but just some notions that, um, uh, yes, it's okay to be African American. <coughs> it's a really good thing. Uh, and we have to figure out how to make that clear to non-African Americans with racialized identities uh, that there are costs and uh, deep political histories and uh, that have to be understood and put together in some politically important, productive way. Angela. 